Um, you know, the, the chief and the mayor uh, early on set the tone about dignity and respect for the event. And, and we'd said all along, one of the confident angles we had going into the RFC is that we are, even though we're an upper mid-sized city, uh, we're a big event city, having over 800 events a year, a lot of dynamism in those events, um, a lot of operational things that have to go on. You just you get patience is in your DNA when you do a lot of big events. And um, so we knew we had that side going for us. What was a challenge for us was that, um, you know, the only thing we had to work off was the after-action reports of previous events. We didn't have the luxury of, of seeing an RNC prior to the one that we were awarded um, in basically in the middle of 2010. And what happens is you typically get a, uh, you know, a federal planning template uh, for the national special security event process. And, you know, in defense of the Secret Service and everything else, you know, they have to come up with a pretty standardized model because they go all over the country and do things and they interact with different, um, different maybe even value systems of different law enforcement agencies and different capabilities of law enforcement agencies. So, you know, in the end, they're going to get graded on the safety of the event uh, at the federal level. And, and, you know, but they're always in a dance with a different jurisdiction. So you can understand why they're so templated. But <clears throat> I think if I had to pick a coin or phrase for this one, is sometimes you do have to reinvent the wheel. And I think what was important for us to reinvent the wheel was to not take the previous uh, or not accept the previous results of other events and really strive to make a difference. And that started long before the week of the event. Um, hundreds of hours went into training, very meticulous training, uh, into all of the uh, supervisors and commanders and even the line personnel that were going to be involved in the event to make sure that they understood not only, <clears throat> uh, you know, did we have the benefit of using Florida-based resources, but um, you know, we were able to instill the tone of the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County, as well as the regional tone of how we were going to operate during the week. Um, one thing I think uh, was, a, you know, you know, probably come out some of the questioning was just fine, but I'll address it on the front end. Um, you know, everybody was a, a little critical of the number of resources. Um, but one thing you have to do is, is to get a quick understanding of the number of resources you know, I think the chief had said publicly it was about 3,500 that went into the entire plan. There's 26 operational subcommittees that involved everything from all the specialty teams and transportation. And, and of course, the crowd management part was the most visible in the tan uniforms with the bikes. But the one thing you've got to do is that about 1,800 of those resources, or a little over half, were dedicated to the crowd management. But they had regional responsibility. So if if something happened over at St. Petersburg or on the beach or at a hotel or something, they had a shuttle over and handle that, or they were already pre-positioned to handle that. So that's you know a little bit of a diminishment on those numbers. The other part that a lot of folks don't understand is that you know we were planning to operate in a in basically a mean temperature of 105 to 125 degrees a day for 12-hour shifts, and hence the tan uniforms, which. You know, the other good unintended consequence was the fact that, you know, on the strong side, it looked like one good coalition of service. On the other side, it was uh, probably a little softer than an eclectic police uniform would have been. So it was a benefit to the officers in the heat. It was a force multiplier in mystique uh, for anybody who really wanted to do criminal behavior. And on the other side, um, you know, it, it had a look of unity and it was a little bit softer for the community. But you have to basically uncube those resources to realize what was available because not only was there three shifts to deploy, you know, day shift, evening, and an overnight or midnight shift, but then you had to divide them by three again because the work rest cycle required that I had one group down resting, another group in the field, and another group staged for any trouble that may have started over and above what we would have been able to tolerate or use discretion on. So those resources were essentially cubed in the way they were operating. So while it looked like there was a large amount of, uh, of resources dedicated to that um, or to the field, it was, you know, again, using the same line that Mr. Schimberg used, is we prepared for the worst and hope for the best. And, and I think that gave us the opportunity to use a lot of patience and understanding 
Because um, we drew, and we said that, I think, through all three sessions, we drew a very bright line between being flexible and using a lot of discretion, and that line was on the other side of intentional criminal acts. You know, we just didn't see the value in damaging property or injuring people or setting a tone that that was going to be the norm if you were going to demonstrate because the flip side of that behavior is that people that would normally come out and express themselves may stay home. And that's really not what we're after. If you're actually going to make sure the democratic process, the way I understand it, is that you can come out in town hall and speak your mind, whatever town hall metaphorically is described as, that if you come out in town hall that you'd feel safe to do so. And, of course, we applied a lot of flexibility to the parade dynamics and the gathering dynamics because we do realize that trying to design a parade route in what we jokingly call a cul-de-sac of downtown because it's surrounded by water on three sides, and then you have a, a pretty hefty neighborhood beyond that that has to, to uh, traverse the, the downtown core. I'm trying to come up with a, a viewing area and a parade route that allows the cross streets to work, allows the emergency service traffic to work, allows uh, you know sight and sound for the event. And again, credit to Mr. Schimberg and, and Rebecca and Mr. Rainsberger's team. They really did a good job of, of trying to synthesize that space. But in the end, if that's not what you want to use, that's not what you want to use. And and so, you know, through the training and talking and understanding with the chief and the mayor and the sheriff, you know, we we put our latitude cap on and we said, listen, you know, we're gonna we're gonna let the streets be consumed within reason. We're gonna let these spaces be consumed within reason, as long as the uh, the criminal activity didn't erupt, and, and we're we're happy for everybody who demonstrated at the meeting that, you know, there was there was a few in there that you could tell that were looking for an opportunity, but. I think between the dialogue, the collaboration, and and I, I will have to say the presence is part of that, the law enforcement presence. It kept things to, to what we believe is reasonable to allow those uh, latitudes to happen as far as taking over the street and, and the space. And, and there was some antagonistic behavior to law enforcement, which, you know, again, I'm going to be a little biased. I don't know that that's necessary. Um, you know, if you don't, um, you know, freedom of speech is freedom of speech, so you have it. But, you know, the antagonistic part, and the officers had a tremendous amount of patience uh, with that, and they still allow things to go on, even though it's some of those gestures on the law enforcement side, whether it was supplying water or food or reconfiguring space, seemed to be forgotten 24 hours after the next demonstration. Um, it still seemed to work out for the collective good, which was the most important part for us. So keep in mind that we had another night of, of demonstrating an event to handle that was not part of the original plan, uh, which stretched the budget and the personnel resources to go to St. Pete, but we worked through all of that, again, in all the contractual language and the, and the mutual aid agreement. And that's what we do in this community, whether it's a natural challenge like a hurricane, a large event, um, like the Super Bowl, the RNC or Gasparilla, we come together and we rely on our partnerships to get the job done. So I think that kind of sums up uh, our vantage point and we appreciate this opportunity again to share our perspective, and we'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Thanks very much. Mr. Watson? Uh, one of the urban legends that we were told about in Minnesota was that the city police and the county police, when people went up to talk to them about how the RNC had gone four years ago, was that you couldn't get them in the same room to talk to you. So whether that's really true or not, I don't know, but in terms of preparing for it here, all these agencies uh, and agencies that aren't even here, the sheriff's office, the, the state attorney's office, you know, there were more meetings than we'd ever want to go to, uh, and more planning for this, but all these different groups got together, and for the most part, most of the groups get along fairly well, professionally, and lots of them personally, uh, and you know, people at the beginning were saying lots of good things, and so you're hoping, boy, I sure hope it turns out that way. And I think to everyone's belief and, and perhaps joy, it really did. So I think the things that, that uh, Chief Castor and Chief Bennett were saying at the beginning in terms of how they were going to respond, that's exactly how uh, the Tampa Police Department responded. And on, on the last day, the Sheriff's Office, I guess, would have had an opportunity down uh, at the power plant, if they wanted to, to make some arrests, they could have arrested some people, and they gave them 
the discretion that you've described. Uh, and, and from our perspective, we work and work to have plenty of people on hand, and the sheriff had, had arranged all these things for all the people who are going to be arrested to deal with, and it, it turned out we didn't have to deal with that, except for those couple guys who got arrested. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, it's, we would not say, oh, we were disappointed by that. When people get arrested, it's a bad thing for them. I, I, I told people ahead of time, if you meet us, your day didn't go well. <laughs> Or your night didn't go well because you've been booked and we're, we're, we're talking to you. So the fact that it, that we didn't have to and that we spent a lot of time getting prepared for something that, that turned out to be from our perspective, we just, I mean, obviously TPD was there every day and doing everything. And for us, it, it turned out we didn't have to do all that much, but that's a wonderful thing under these circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder. Thank you. I have a prepared statement. That's right. The West Central Florida Federation of Labor is the Central Labor Council, so I'll be referring to that in my comments. We got involved with this process in December of 2011 when the decision was made by leadership of the CLC to work with the ACLU to motivate the city to address the issue of protecting the right of free speech during the RNC. To that end, we applied for a permit in February of 2012, and as a result of that request and others, the city began the process of initiating, vetting, and finalizing a permit process for the elected representatives of the Tampa City Council. During the process of the establishment of the ordinance, we spoke with different groups that, like us, planned a protest, either formally or informally. We met with several of them, and most did not feel that their free speech was being protected because of onerous regulation by the city. They were present at the numerous city council meetings for the reading of the proposed ordinances and their revisions, and made their feelings known. But as this process waged on, it seemed that several members of the City Council also began to feel that the process was becoming overregulated and in some instances ridiculous. What was finally passed was barely palatable, but we figured we could live with it. So let's fast forward to the first day of the RNC and the coalition to march on the RNC. With a projected attendance of over 5,000 people, this group had worked hard for many months for the opportunity to protest the RNC, and in some cases traveling thousands of miles. Rumors were rampant that anarchists and other ne'er-do-wells were going to attend. There was even some news coverage of suspect items atop of a building that would be used against the police. And I had a phone call from a union member working downtown who warned that the police were carrying M16 rifles. <laughs> Everyone was waited, waiting with their breaths held for the news to unfold of how Tampa would beat back those that would do our city harm and disrupt the RNC. We all expected the worst. Beginning at 10 a.m. that morning, those who wouldn't let the threat of a hurricane stop them, who began massing in Perry Harvey Park. By 10.15, it became apparent that the police presence was to be considerable and that they were determined to intimidate and outnumber the protesters. I cannot speak to individual examples of police coercion, but I heard from several people that simple requests to use the portalettes or visit the comfort stations were met with resistance by the police. During the march, protesters were herded along the police ensured that everyone stayed within the boundaries of the streets left open for foot, tra for foot traffic by basically a contingent of police bodies bringing the group as they marched in front, in back, on the left, and on the right. It was an ugly picture, and I do not think all the hard work of the coalition paid off. The news reports were all about the minor skirmishes, the number of police versus protesters, with nary a word of why they were protesting. I saw the news reports that evening and pictures of the coalition's event, and I thought to myself, that won't be us. This is our town, we have the right to speak out, and we hope we're going to be heard. After seeing the news reports of the coalition's march, I went downtown that next day for myself to see what had changed since the last time I'd been there, which had been the Friday before. I cannot describe, if you don't experience it for yourself, how different our city looked. We had eight-foot fencing everywhere, barricades closing down major roads, and a sea of brown, tan police uniforms. It did not feel like Tampa, but like some foreign country under martial law. Again, it was an ugly picture. I could not believe that any visitor to our city would find this attractive and realize that in the name of security, our city's charm and character were annihilated. Our event was a parade with street theater skits performed at specific points along the official parade route. To my knowledge, we were the only group to utilize a parade route officially, and if you had the opportunity to, to traverse it, you would have quickly seen why. 
I have been lost in downtown Tampa a few times, and I have never seen these roads. The official route was a convoluted path underneath the cross town, past an industrial plant of some sort, and ending at the public protest zone. As we marched on the parade route, we had uniformed bicyclists in front of us, uniformed police on both sides, and a combination of mounted and foot police behind us. It is my understanding we were the only event to have more participants than police. With about 600 people participating in our event, I am offended that our efforts were overshadowed by a comparison in the media of whether our crowd or their crowd was bigger. Because the parade route ended at the official protest zone, we anticipated joining the, those who were there in a show of solidarity. We even had a banner that we would be asking them to sign in recognition of our time protesting at the RNC. Imagine our surprise when we rounded the corner and realized that there was no one, not one single person in the protest set. As we traveled home that evening, we came upon another incident. As we neared Gaslight Park while stopped at a traffic light, we looked over and saw Chief Jane Castor exiting an SUV. She walked in front of our van, drawing our attention to what was going on in the park. We were surprised to see a full city block, the whole park, ringed shoulder to shoulder by uniformed police. Because it was after sunset, we, did, we could not see what the ruckus was about. But after our experience in the parade route, we understood all too well that some other group was under attack. The realization dawned. Protesters really weren't welcome in Tampa during the RNC. In anticipation of coming to speak here tonight, I solicited observations from those who participated in our event. Here's an example from Beth. Because of all the national media attention and the threat of anarchists, I only participated in the AFL-CIO event. I was extremely impressed by how well the event went off and how safe I felt while going through downtown. I was a little disheartened by the large amount spent on security, but feel as though it may have been the very thing that kept us safe. The police who were with us were very nice and supportive of our efforts. From Aaron, I thought the precautions for everything were way over the top. The whole process kind of trampled on groups like us because of the fear of what a small minority of people maybe wanted to do. The parade route sucked, and there were entirely too many officers for what was going on around there. It made it feel like a military presence at times. The parade itself went on easily enough, and actually being there was not a problem. It was more of an issue getting there and leaving. It was not made to easily transport people in and out. And the final one from Judah. The city could have put more police out on the streets. We weren't totally outnumbered. A few more and we would have been. And maybe they could have tried to look more intimidating. Other than that, it would have been nice if we could have been closer to the venue. In closing, I would like to highlight a few points. First, the end result of the ordinance was a reduction in the use of the process. In other words, the control was so extreme that people just threw it out the window. The majority of the protests were not permitted, and it didn't were accomplished ad hoc. Second, the intimidation was extreme, and the physical setup was unwelcoming. Both of these factors could be perceived as an impediment to the exercise of the right of free speech. This is evidenced by the fact that the media was focused on the police and its response to any and all protest, not the protests themselves, and even highlighted the lack of protesters in the official protest zone. I would like to note that everyone I dealt with during this process, or like the Tampa City Council, the City Parks and Rec Department, and yes, even the police were helpful and respectful. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and since I am hoping that there will not be another RNC in Tampa, why well, I am still alive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Henry told me that uh, I should discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly about the RNC. It looks like everyone before me has already covered all three of those. So I will, uh, I will start by, by talking about, uh, first, I was not present for the RNC, so as to not mislead anybody, I had the good fortune to be on vacation during that particular week and wasn't able to witness it firsthand. All my information about it comes, uh, comes secondhand. One thing I did witness, though, uh, was the year leading up to the RNC, uh, a big change in tone, uh, both from the protesters and from the city. It, was, it, w it went from initially confrontational to cooperative very gradually over the course of the year. I want to read to you um, some comments from Norm Stamper, who was the uh, chief of police of Seattle during the WTO protests in 1999. Uh, things went well the first day. We were praised for our friendliness and restraint, though some politicians were apoplectic at our refusal to make mass arrests for the actions of a few. Then came day two. 
Early in the morning, large contingents of demonstrators began to converge at a key downtown intersection. They sat down and refused to budge. Their numbers grew. A labor march would soon add additional thousands to the mix. We have to clear the intersection, said the field commander. We have to clear the intersection, the operations commander agreed from his bunker in the public safety building. Standing alone on the edge of the crowd, I, the chief of police, said to myself, we have to clear the intersection. Why? Because of all the what-ifs. What if a fire breaks out in the Sheridan across the street? What if a woman goes into labor on the 17th floor of the hotel? What if a heart patient goes into cardiac arrests? How would an eight-car fire engine or police cruiser get through that sea of people? The cop in me supported the decision to clear the intersection. But the chief in me should have vetoed it. And he certainly should have forbidden the indiscriminate use of tear gas to accomplish it, no matter how many warnings we barked through the bullhorn. My support for a militaristic solution caused all hell to break loose. Rocks, bottles, and newspaper racks went flying. Windows were smashed, stores were looted, fires lighted, and more gas filled the streets, with some cops clearly overreacting, escalating, and prolonging the conflict. The battle in Seattle, as the WTO protests in their aftermath came to be known, was a huge setback for the protesters, my cops, the community. That's all fresh in our minds, and it was certainly uh, on the minds of everyone leading up to the RNC. And it certainly wasn't the first such protest to go that way, but ever since 1999, there's been this animosity born in Seattle that, that uh, people with, uh, who show up to protest a political gathering mean to cause trouble. And it is the duty of law enforcement to squelch that dissent. And, and it created this tone that lingered for, for years and years where uh, uh, what, what uh, Norm Stamper calls the militarization of police, uh, police officers viewing themselves as, as these agents of feudal lords to, to quash a peasant uprising. And, and that sort of mentality uh, pervaded on both sides of, of, uh, of such events all the way up until the RNC. I think we started there. I think we started, and you heard even some city officials uh, use tough talk against these, these anarchists, these protesters that are going to come to our city to cause trouble. But slowly, and, and, and thanks much to the efforts of uh, Chief Castor, Assistant Chief Bennett, uh, Jim Schimberg, some ACLU people, if you could permit me a couple more high fives uh, to Mike Fenneker and, and Joyce Hamilton Henry, this, this coming together and holding meetings like this and having a dialogue between uh, law enforcement and people who wanted to come to Tampa to exercise their, their free speech rights, we realized slowly over a year that we're actually all kind of on the same side, that nobody wants what happened in Seattle to happen in Tampa, um, that we can have a dialogue and work with each other. And I can give a couple examples of, of beautiful things that happened. One of them was something as simple as uh, the artist that wanted to put in an ice sculpture that said middle class and we can watch it slowly melt in the Florida sun and make a uh, beautiful artistic statement, and the permit was for Monday when they thought that a, uh, a hurricane would be coming, and they wanted to move it to Sunday, and thanks to the efforts of Mr. Schimberg, they were able to do that without any problems. Um, police officers distributing water, um, the incident where people chained themselves together in front of the power plant and were dutifully unchained uh, by police officers, and then no property damage, everybody can just go home. Um, this set a tone of cooperation between the city and, and protesters, um, such that the protesters came to understand that the city of Tampa does not view itself as this force to, to squash dissent. Instead, it's a force to protect the protesters themselves and to protect their right to, to voice their opinions, and that Tampa really is a, a paradise where, where both peoples, um, both sides of an argument can have their argument judged by its merits and not by which side has the power to do tear gas canisters. So, as you heard, there are certainly some complaints, but there also was not an incident much like there was in, in uh, Seattle. And I think that the tone that was set of, of cooperation and uh, free speech as something to be protected and nurtured and encouraged, uh, as opposed to something to be uh, squashed, had an effect on both the protesters and the city. And, and it really was an opportunity for Tampa to shine and show the rest of the country how holding a gathering like this is supposed to be done. And Tampa did do that. Um, so that's, that, that's a beautiful thing that came out of the RNC, and I hope that, that Tampa's a model for future political gatherings that will also draw protesters, regardless of, of uh, the particular politics of any particular gathering. Um, Tampa showed the rest of the country that you can have 
two diametrically opposed groups in the same city each exercising their free speech right to express their point of view and it does not have to be uh, a violent uh, endeavor. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about in terms of the bad and the ugly is that going forward from the RNC, what can happen sometimes is um, we lawyers know that you can get a different answer to the same question uh, depending on where you start. The famous parable being uh, the chain-smoking priest who asks the visiting bishop, is it all right for me to smoke while I am praying? And, and here's the answer, of course not. It's disrespectful and dissatisfied with that answer. Asks a later visiting archbishop, is it okay for me to pray while I am smoking? And receives the answer, of course it's always okay to pray. <laughs> when you start, from where you start can sometimes determine the answer. The most visible um, 